Não digo apresentar, porque todos já ouviram falar, mas apresentar a palestra do professor James Green. Ele tem uma carreira é, realmente impressionante. Ele mudou de áreas, pelo menos tantas vezes quanto Elizabeth Taylor mudou de marido, e sempre com muito sucesso. É, começou com álgebra C estrela, é, quer dizer, na verdade, ele fez um bacharelado em engenharia e daí um doutorado com um tese em álgebra C estrela. É, daí, eu não sei se eu tenho a cronologia certa, mas ele fez, ele trabalhou em leis de conservação, é, fornecendo o que é a base, ainda é a base é, dos resultados mais importantes sobre leis hiperbólicas de conservação. É, em seguida, ele, ele achou que aquilo era teórico demais e foi trabalhar em teoria quântica dos campos, em colaboração com Arthur Jeffrey, num momento que era esplendoroso da física matemática. Feito isso, ele voltou ao método que ele tinha, é, que ele tinha feito para provar a existência de soluções de leis de conservação e primeiro transformou num método numérico de alta qualidade e, segundo, fez uma generalização é, para mais dimensões. Da, o chamado, que na época chamava-se front tracking, e mudou de nome também, porque foi um nome bem sucedido e outras pessoas se apossaram. Eu tive a honra de participar desse momento, dessa transição. Depois disso, ele começou a aplicar é, essas ideias em meios porosos e também em interfaces sobre líquidos, entre líquidos diferentes, é, resolvendo problemas é, que me escapam. Eu provavelmente estou deixando de, de, de falar de alguma das áreas. E eu estou falando em português porque eu não preciso dizer a ele o que ele fez. Uma coisa que sempre me impressionou, ele é extremamente exigente para, com os alunos dele, mas não mais do que com ele mesmo. Eu, isso é um, um, sei lá, eu recebia telefonemas, nós, todos nós recebemos telefonemas às três, quatro horas da manhã, com frequência, e... Não podíamos reclamar, porque ele não tinha acordado exclusivamente para nos telefonar. É. Outra coisa, assim, ele é conhecido por ter respondido, uma vez que ele viajava muito, naquela época ele era convidado para todos os lugares, como é que era essa vida de, de andarilho? E ele respondia, bem, em todos os hotéis, todos os quartos de hotéis são iguais. Ele é um trabalhador dedicadíssimo, e eu tenho muito orgulho de ter sido aluno dele, e dele estar aqui agora. Uh, I, Jim, I decided that uh, you know what you've done. 
Therefore, I didn't have to explain it to you. So I spoke Portuguese, and I'm sure I forgot a number of things. Uh, well, thank you, Dan. Um, uh, I can't, and I'm sure it was all very well that you told me that question first. And in any event, um, thank you very much. Well, first, um, pleasant to be here. I always enjoy trips to Rio. Um, yes. Um, so I think you <coughs> I'm assuming your presentation was a description was probably overly generous, but being in Portuguese, I'm not in a position to complain. <laughs> um, but in any case, it's always very pleasant to be here in Rio, and so I thank the uh, organizers for inviting me. Um, I have some comments about the meeting as a whole and in relating to uh, my talk, the, the issue of nonlinearity is basically an issue of one-dimensional waves, which has been probably the major focus, a major focus of this meeting. Very interdisciplinary, and I think that's very good. Uh, problems don't come in, into departments. They come across multiple departments, and so bringing many different people, expertise together is very good. Uh, I also will talk about uh, heterogeneity and scale-up, <clears throat> and these are basically <clears throat> three-dimensional issues and uh, not the issue of this conference, but per certainly a good um, topic for Interpol, perhaps some other meeting. Um, and these are actually, uh, these two generate dispersion, and there's some uh, conflict between these two notions. And that's basically what I want to talk about, is that conflict between nonlinearity and dispersion. So, uh, um, I almost didn't come here because I told Dan I haven't been doing petroleum reservoirs for some number of decades, and he said I should come anyway. So uh, I tried to figure out why the turbulence modeling, which I've done, is actually relevant, and so that's what this talk is about, why <clears throat> my recent activities are, are actually relevant to some older activities. So we have this algorithm for front tracking, and I, whoops, I want to um, explain that, um, and that might be useful for um, some uh, shock waves or, or uh, oil banks or whatever in the middle of a combustion front or a, some kind of process. Um, <clears throat> and so the second part of the talk is whether or not this is relevant, and I'm not going to answer that question. I will leave that as a question to the audience. So uh, we've been doing Front tracking, uh, that's where I started working with Dan shortly after his thesis, and the early paper goes from back to 1980, so that's quite a while ago. Um, and it's gone through a lot of transformations, and this is just some recent, uh, recent improvements. We have intrinsic geometry totally rewriting everything uh, in terms of uh, a very geometrical notion. Uh, we have an API application programming interface, so you can systematically you can get a hold of this algorithm without getting at all the details. Uh, we have coupling to uh, scale up, which are subgrid terms, and we have coupling to elliptic and parabolic solvers. And so those are just uh, examples of recent uh, additions to this algorithm. So <clears throat> as it's been reconstructed, the, um, this is in the spirit of differential geometry, where you have neighborhoods and coordinate patches. And a <clears throat> uh, discrete mathematics, a coordinate patch is called a stencil. So we have um, a collection of triangle, a point, and around the point you have some triangles. And the triangles touch other triangles, so you get a larger stencil. <clears throat> These are called rings, and so you get rings of a certain size and you take the stencil big enough to support the differential operators and constructions you're trying to map out. Now, the basic idea is that locally the surface is uh, somewhat flat, so you can have a one-dimensional uh, height function, and you, th and you have a tangent plane, and the surface is a height uh, above or below the tangent plane. And that's um, a very conventional idea, and the, um, so at every mesh point, near the point you're looking at, you have a height relative to that point. And 
the rest of it is extremely straightforward. Um, you apply classical differential geometry and you can get good formulas for normals and curvatures and differential operators. And what I find rather amazing is that uh, this late into the development of numerical methods, this was all very original. This is the work of my colleague, Zhang Min Zhao. And um, we had all struggled over good definitions of normals and basically uh, failed. And the rest of the community has also failed. And he solved that problem and much more. Um, and the idea is to pick a large enough stencil so it you not just enough to give you the equations you need for the polynomial coefficient of the height function, but larger so that you have overdetermined and the equations are no longer solvable. And then you find an approximate solution by least squares. And the point is that it gives you a robustness against uh, poor quality meshes, for example. Um, so uh, this is a systematic framework, accurate and stable numerical computation on discrete surfaces. They go up to sixth order. You can go whatever order you want. We're going to be happy to go through second order. And um, uh, the theoretical unification of differential geometry and linear algebra, et cetera, global surface uh, reconstruction by blending local polynomials, et cetera. So here's the proof of the pudding. This is a uh, triangulated sphere and a torus. And this is the uh, error for the normal calculation and the error for the curvature. And these slopes have the slope they're supposed to for sixth, fourth, second, and so on order, and the same over here. So it's a um, completely robust and correct and proven um, uh, numerical algorithm. Uh, now, another thing we're adding, <clears throat> this is not in there yet, <clears throat> but we're proposing that the whole world, this, we're proposing to turn this loose on the world. And when we turn it loose on the world, we don't want to get midnight calls about, hey, my program has a bug in it, and so on. So um, the most common failure of the program as we have it has to do with uh, self-intersection and the resolution of the self-intersections. And we can go do quite a lot, but the surfaces get even more complicated. So in addition, we want a graceful um, end to a tracking regime. Um, these are called arbitrary lagrange eulerian algorithms, and that's a staple of um, uh, some branches of fluid dynamics. And all of those algorithms <clears throat> become, over time, as they evolve into more complicated flow patterns, become more eulerian. So as you dynamically stop tracking certain triangles, then they, that part of the algorithm becomes completely Eulerian. Uh, and this should, uh, we believe that this will make this into a very robust algorithm. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to describe the um, API, the front tracking interface. This is the um, thesis of Ryan Kaufman, and it's still uh, we're still putting the finishing touches on this, so there might be a few changes in details. But the idea is you, <clears throat> you have client functions. That's what the user has to supply. And you have server functions. That's what the, um, the API supplies. So in a sense, these you don't have to worry about. These are hidden. Uh, and there's basically three operations that the client has to perform, and that's it. So those three operations require, I don't know what, a, uh, maybe nine or ten functions. So it's not a, it's not a very complicated interface. And these are the main, uh, the main things are to move the front points. You have fronts and front states, and you have to update interior states near the front. If you don't change the interior algorithm, it doesn't know that you're tracking it, and you get the same uh, algorithm you had to begin with. So. Um, these are the two main things the, uh, that the API has to accomplish. Um, and uh, so for the interior solver, you have two issues. When the, um, the stencil, you have, say you have a one-dimensional stencil, so you're splitting x and y and z. And you just do the x sweep, and the x sweep uh, crosses the front. <clears throat> 
you have to do something about that or else you have the old algorithm and it doesn't do you any good. And you have the same issue in time when the front crosses a cell center in time. You can't do conservative differencing inside a cell because the top and the bottom are on different sides of the front. And then we have to propagate the front point and the front states. So those are the three items. And if you do all those three, um, then you have, you have uh, implemented your API. So we do need states on the front. We had dreamed of not doing that, uh, but we did a test and they're actually, the, leaving them out was not accurate, so we need to put those in. Um, so at every point on the front, uh, you have a pair of states, um, uh, which I would guess I would call in this meeting, I call burned and unburned. Uh, so they're the two sides, say, of a flame front. They're the burned and unburned states. And the, uh, they're joined by a Riemann problem, which gives you the, uh, the flame front composition if you have a sh uh, for that uh, bur joining the burned and unburned state. Or it could be an oil bank and, a, and the um, uh, residual uh, 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 primitive oil uh, saturation. Um, and so these are uh, related by solution of a Riemann problem, and it depends on the physics. And this could be a, a, a flame front or an oil bank or a um, contact wave for um, some chemical displacement front. And uh, you, these states are dynamic variables. They have to be updated at every time step. Um, so the idea when the um, stencil crosses the front and you want to do the differencing uh, then the differencing on this side that you don't want to know about the other side, um, you have to somehow make fake states on the other side, and those are called ghost states. And this is an algorithm that um, Dan Marcheson participated in the discovery. Um, so here's your uh, stencil and you're trying to update these black states over here and you've got white states. So you copy the front state over and you get uh, pseudo or ghost state, uh, black state, ghost states, and you do the differencing only with black states. So the interior solver doesn't see the discontinuity. That's the idea. The physics of the discontinuity is carried by the Riemann problem <clears throat> that connects the, um, the white to the black, but it, uh, the interior solver doesn't see it. Um, now there's a similar issue when you cross the, uh, in time, you cross from the bottom to the top, and I won't go into detail there. I should say these slides are a little bit more detailed than is good for a presentation. Uh, what I had in mind was something between a conference talk and a tutorial, and so I'm gonna give the conference talk, but the slides are sitting there, and anyone that wants a tutorial can look at the slides I don't present, and that'll be their tutorial. So there's a little more in here that I won't, I won't present every slide. So this is the crossing, um, uh, the front crosses from yellow uh, at step N to, uh, it's from blue at step N to yellow at step N plus one. So the front has crossed the cell center, and if you, if you had a, um, a cell, a, with time in the vertical direction, you'd have the front going through the middle of it. Uh, so we're only on plan A, and that's all I'm gonna talk about. And then the point propagate for the front points, that's a uh, second order runga cutta, so you propagate um, at the front point, you have solved your Riemann problem, so you have a wave speed, whatever the physics is, there's a wave speed for that physics, whether it's a flame front or whatever, and you move the front with that wave speed, that's first order accurate. <clears throat> but you do the same thing at the new time level, when you get the states at the new time level, you also have a flame speed, and you have these two flame speeds at time n and n plus one, and you just average them, and that's the standard second order runga cutta algorithm. So that gives you a second order accurate propagation. So um, everything is complete if you know how to move the um, front points, uh, the front states. Now, um, that's a little bit complicated. I'm gonna 
uh, be a little bit uh, gloss over that. The front states moving from level n to n plus 1, uh, <clears throat> we use an operator split idea in coordinates that are normal and tangential to the front. So the tangential uh, in the tangent plane at the front <clears throat> so somewhat conventional idea. You just use your different solvers in an oblique direction uh, going east and west or whatever. Um, and in the normal direction, which is going orthogonal to the front, um, we use the method of characteristics. So you trace backwards to um, align normal to the front and get data that you can move up on characteristic curves. So that's basically the plan. I don't have the uh, more details in these slides. Um, uh, I think I'll skip over this. Uh, so this is a picture of uh, how we interpolate to get data at the front. Um, and I will skip over these. And uh, so that's really all I say about the front tracking algorithm. I want to come back to this. The major question, I think, from the point of view of this meeting is whether it's going to be useful to your problems or not. And that I will come back to at more depth. Uh, but first of all, I want to talk about why it might not be helpful. And basically, these fronts arise in um, nonlinear processes. The nonlinear Buckley Leverett laws, nonlinear flames are very nonlinear. They're strongly nonlinear. Um, Buckley Leverett, I would say, is weakly nonlinear, and it typically does not win out over the dispersive forces. Reservoirs are very highly dispersive with all the uh, layers and very different geology. Uh, the flame fronts are much more strongly nonlinear, and so they might uh, win out over, head, over dispersion. So anyway, the um, scale up and the subgrid terms, that's what we're talking about now. So this is the language of reservoirs, and this is the language of turbulence. And it's really uh, pretty much the same thing. Um, and um, the idea is that when you're computing, the, the value at a cell is not thought of as a point value, but a cell average value. So you have a grid block, and you've averaged over that cell on that point at that, the value at that point is the average in that cell. That's, it's interpreted as a cell average. Uh, now, that's fine for a linear expression, but if you have a nonlinear expression and you average it, you all know that the average of the product is not equal to the product of the average, right? Everybody knows that. So averaging a nonlinear function is bad news. But you have nonlinear functions. You don't have a lot of choice. So you have to do something about that. And the answer is you have to figure out what kind of an error you make, and you have to compensate. So these are the subgrid terms, and they typically add diffusion or dispersion to the solution. And so the net result is that it gives you wider fronts. Uh, now in the... Um, Petroleum reservoirs, the, um, the nonlinear terms have their own dispersive effect, and uh, we'll get to those. But even more important is the reservoir heterogeneity, which is also dispersive. That's a major dispersive force. And it, either one leads to wider fronts. So um, here I'm being a little bit technical relative to this meeting. This is the Reynolds stress. That's a typical term in turbulence. Uh, the uh, analogy for reservoirs would be the, uh, the uh, Buckley Leverett. Uh, you have what? Uh, v times F of S. And if you average this, it's not equal to V bar f of s bar. So the difference between these two is what, uh, con what the scale, scale up is trying to deal with. Now, uh, the turbulence people have a very highly developed method for dealing with this. 
and so it might be interesting to the reservoir community. Now, but maybe it isn't because um, Lou Derlowski also has a nice way of dealing with it. And for all I know, the two methods are the same. So that's a good question. Somebody could go and look at it and see if <clears throat> you could make an improvement in Lou Derlowski, or maybe Lou Derlowski could make an improvement for turbulence, or maybe they both do the same thing. Uh, but anyway, um, the idea is that uh, you have to have some model for this. And the model is generally uh, the gradient of the quantity here that you're looking at, so the gradient of the velocity in this case. Um, and then the, co the gradient has a coefficient. And these uh, methods were notorious for quite a few years because there was a lot of argument about the coefficients, which are always different for different problems. And um, finally, in Stanford, uh, they figured out that they're supposed to be different, and they had a formula that gave you a different coefficient for every mesh block. Every space-time mesh block has its own coefficient, has its private turbulence model coefficient. Those are called dynamic uh, turbulence models. So the basic idea is you start with a conservation law and put bars over everything, then the problem is that the uh, average of the nonlinear term is not the nonlinear term of the average. So you write what you have as what you wish you had plus an error term. So this is simply defined as the difference between these two. Um, so uh, here you have this difference. And if you expand it out, um, uh, everything looks the same. Uh, now, this is supposed to be a, an equivalent sign. Equivalent, it didn't show up in these. <coughs> it got lost in translation. This is a, a, a twiddle, twiddle sign. <coughs> but this is the key modeling step. You take this thing you don't know, <coughs> and you write it as an unknown coefficient times the gradient of the uh, fundamental solution. So then you write it like this, and it looks like just what you had before, except you've, uh, you've fiddled with the, um, with the coefficient of the Laplacian. And in reservoir language, that's called scale up. And you get a, <coughs> a um, modified buckley leverett equation. So there's something called Germano's identity, and it's a formula for that missing coefficient. And this is from the language of turbulence. <clears throat> but I suppose it's also what Derlowski does. Uh, and it turns out that if you look at the grid level you're looking at, and then you average, so you go to one grid level coarser, at one grid level coarser, you have two ways to do the averaging. You can do them at two orders. You can average the, uh, the basic equation you had, or you can go at one grid level coarser and do the construction with the subgrid models there. And so you have the same problem either way, but it turns out if you subtract, all the things you don't know disappear. And all that survives are things you do know. And included in what you do know is that missing coefficient. So you get an extra equation for that missing coefficient. Now, the equations are a little bit uh, tedious to go through, and I think I would um, kill the audience if I tried to go through the details. But I'd rather you just understood the ideas. The idea is that you have two equations you don't, with a missing term, and the difference is identical. So you subtract, and the missing term disappears. But that coefficient doesn't. It survives, and you get an equation for the coefficient. Does everybody follow it at that level? So that's great. You guys are experts in turbulence. <laughs> I would get a job as an aeronautical engineer if, if the oil, reservoir, oil ever runs out. OK, so um, the idea is that um, you get an equation for the coefficient, and you can write the uh, SGS term as the coefficient times the model. You have to assume a model. So we assume the model, and then you get an equation for the coefficient. And that's scale up. Um, now I want to get to petroleum reservoirs. And typically, um, the geologists 
um, have a super fine grid, and uh, they might even have an ensemble of reservoirs for you. Um, and you have to take that super fine grid and make it into something that's coarse enough that you can do a practical simulation for it. And so there's a scale up process in doing that. And um, it's the same issue. You have these nonlinear functions that are defined on the, on the fine grid, and you have to get the effects of the nonlinear functions on the coarse grid, which is a di dispersion term. And what that does is it adds um, uh, uh, a diffusion term to your transport equations. So here's your typical uh, V dot F of S, and you multiply it by gradient S, and then this unknown coefficient, and there's another, uh, there's a divergence out here, so it's conservative, and so it looks like that. Uh, now, um, for a flame speed spade, sp uh, scale up, um, you need um, you need to have the flame speed, the modified flame speed, and you'd have to answer questions like this. No, I'm not going to get into this. I regard that as everybody else's business at this conference. I'm not going to uh, tell you guys how to do your own business. You, you're supposed to know this. You're supposed to tell me what the answers are to these questions. Um, now, continuing, um, sometimes you have to solve elliptic equations. There's the pressure equation, and there's other elliptic equations, and they might have discontinuous coefficients. So we've also developed a um, method for dealing with um, discontinuous coefficients in elliptic equations called the embedded boundary method. This is, uh, started with Kalela and uh, Xu Chang Wang when he was at Stony Brook, and now it's been continued with uh, 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 Sha Shui uh, in, in his uh, thesis, which is still being written. Um, and the idea, again, I want to emphasize rather than the details. The idea is to take all the data from cell centers. That's where it's given to you in the first place. So there's no, um, that's the only data you have, but you um, add extra points into the difference stencil. Um, so if you have a cut cell, you have a cell and a cut going through the middle of it. You want to figure out the flux that goes across this boundary. You need a, you need a point in the middle of the boundary to, uh, decide where that flux is located. So you introduce extra points and data at extra points, but that data is, um, has to be derived from cell center data. Um, and that leads to some uh, algebraic equations. And from this principle, you could write down the entire method. It's a little tacky. And I'll just give you an example. I won't derive the formulas for you, but I'll give you an example. Um, well, this is the same thing I just told you, so I can skip over that. So here's an example of a cut cell. And here's the example of an equation a flux is equal to uh, a diffusion coefficient times a gradient. And then you take the uh, uh, divergence of f to get to equal some source term. That's a typical elliptic equation, or it could be parabolic with a d by dt in there. Um, and so you have to, in a cut cell, you have to get the, um, the flux is defined and the source is defined. Of appropriate to that boundary. And then you write this out in the normal way. Uh, only cell center unknowns and fluxes, new fluxes at the face or boundary, the centroids of the boundary or the faces. And uh, what we did at Stony Brook recently was to take an anisotropic tensor. And uh, I'll show you an example of that 
And in fact, this example comes from uh, studying uh, cardiac fibrillation and uh, a defibrillator, which is a defibrillator you put a uh, 4,000 volts on each side of the heart and it shocks and puts it sort of back to zero. And if it's in a chaotic state, it will, uh, you hope it'll restart normally. Uh, and so we wanted to model that. Um, and this code was for that purpose. So anyway, we have um, the electrical signal in the heart is the reaction diffusion equation. There are chemical um, source terms that come from flow of ionic currents in the, in the, uh, neurons, in the um, neurons in the cardiac tissue, calcium, sodium, potassium currents, and they carry the electricity. And then there's a diffusion term uh, which uh, moves the voltage around. And this is for the, uh, the diffusion term, and it has some sharp boundaries in it, and it has a tensor because the um, electrical diffusion is faster along the cells and slower going across the cells. Um, and we have uh, a flux term at, the, at these flux terms, which I won't go through. And to get second order accurate, we need second order approximations to, um, uh, to the uh, source terms and the fluxes. And then that gives a second order convergence. Uh, and because we have a sharp boundary, this is second order in the L infinity norm, which means it's uniform up to the boundary. So uh, this is one of the slides I won't go through, but it just shows you the kind of equations. If you want to trace this down, it gives you examples of uh, the equation. Now here's the result slide. And <clears throat> what we're interested in when you apply the voltage at the outside of the heart, the voltage uh, has to get into the interior of the heart, and it does that by concentrating its source terms at the blood vessels in the heart. A blood vessel is a discontinuity in the electrical structure of the heart, and so it's like a source term. And so this 4,000 volts lands on the walls of the vessels, all the vessels in the heart, and that distributes the voltage and resets everything to zero. So we are interested in um, whether we had to worry about small blood vessels or only large ones. And so um, this uh, red signal here is the voltage that has, uh, as it, uh, and the green are the voltage as it, on the side of the heart. And you see red and green and not so much here. So this one didn't have much of a role. It's a little too small. Uh, <clears throat> we're using an existing electrocardiac code from Flavio Fenton. And he had um, a very wide boundaries, so he couldn't, he couldn't do a calculation like this in any practical way. But we could do the sharp boundary, and we could look at the small blood vessels. And so we'll do that as a study uh, working with him. Um, and then the parabolic solvers use this diffusion tensor. That's a straightforward issue. Um, so uh, that's really what I wanted to say about petroleum reservoirs. I'll say a little bit about my recent work in turbulent mixing. But I think first I should stop and uh, have questions or discussion on the reservoir portion of this talk. So if anybody has a question now, I'll, I'll take an intermediate break. OK, no questions? All right, well, um, I want to talk about turbulent mixing. And that turns out to be a um, killer of a problem. And I'll show you some of the uh, booby traps. Um, the, um, the flows get very complicated, and the um, diffusion processes are a little bit slow, so you get imperfect mixing. And eventually, you want these things to react and burn or whatever. And so the imperfect or partially partial mixing is an important part of figuring out what's going to happen when they react. Um, and you'll have the same problem in your oil reservoirs um, when you go to heterogeneous geometries. So this is a um, 
classic instability problem uh, called Rayleigh-Taylor. You have a heavy fluid uh, pushing against a light fluid. So you think of heavy fluid up here like water and light fluid like air underneath. And of course, it's unstable, not due to the air pressure. There's plenty of pressure in the air to hold up the water, but due to instabilities in the surface. And so you get uh, raindrops coming down. So it's a surface instability problem. And the interface grows at an overall rate. Uh, and we get uh, molecular mixing, which is uh, a kind of second moment. And this is, this is the kind of thing that would show up in a, um, in a model for combustion. If you're trying to burn the two fluids when, on contact, that would be the combustion term. So uh, the idea is to find um, turbulence models that are survive uh, combustion processes. So here's an example, uh, and this is uh, the evolving front, and you'll see it's going through all the data points. Very complicated interface. All right, so that's what I would call good validation. Um, so um, to back off for a minute and talk about whether this is important or not, um, it really depends. This is the, uh, the bottom line. If your fronts are 2 to 3 delta x wide, any, any old solver will be just perfectly good enough. And if they're not 2 to 3 delta x wide, if they're smaller, then you need to uh, do something to control numerical diffusion. And front tracking seems to be the primary way to do that. So um, this is partly reservoir dependent because it has to do with the geology. It's partly nonlinear. The strength of the nonlinear uh, terms, so the flame fronts are very nonlinear, and they might overcome all the little thin layers and give you uh, more or less uniform flame fronts. And um, has to do with the uh, the intrinsic width of the chemistry. If you do, if you're trying to resolve an internal flame structure, then you don't want to track it. You want to resolve it, but that is going to take not two to three mesh blocks, that's likely to take 10 mesh blocks. Resolved chemistry, typically 10, 10 to 20 mesh blocks, or else you have a very phenomenological model. So those are the choices you have with, with combustion. You can take a sharp front, or you can resolve the chemistry. You need a lot more than this number of delta x. Um, so you have to pick a method that's appropriate for your problem. So which fronts are narrow and which are wide? So we did original calculations. Buckley levered fronts are narrow. They're about five feet, typical reservoir parameters. Typical mesh blocks are, um, say, 10 mesh blocks to a, a quarter mile or 20 mesh blocks to a quarter mile. So the, the Buckley levered front is a fraction of a mesh block. However, uh, reservoirs are heterogeneous, and heterogeneous reservoir, they are wide, and you don't want to track them. So we don't recommend tracking Buckley Leverett fronts. The point is that the nonlinearity, which gives you this five foot wide front, is overwhelmed by the dispersion. Uh, the layering of the res typical reservoir has many layers, and so you get conduction zones and non conduction zones, and the whole thing spreads out. And there's nothing, there's nothing there that's worth tracking. Um, miscible displacement fronts, it should be the same story. Um, but flame fronts are another matter uh, where the viscosity affects heavy oil. You can change the flame fronts. <coughs> the um, viscosity can change by factors of 1,000 or 10,000. So you can have huge huge variations in the uh, nonlinear terms due to the thermal effects in a flame front. So it's, um, 
it's possible that uh, tracking has a role um, for uh, flat fronts. Um, Uh, but I'm not going to have an opinion on that. I'm going to leave that. Uh, that's, that's, for, that's a homework assignment for the audience to figure out. Now, in fact, um, whether you want to track something or not uh, depends very much on your scientific model, and it depends on the details that you're... So there's, sometimes you want to resolve everything, and then you don't want to track it anyway. Sometimes there's an internal layer, and then there's other stuff, and you can resolve it partly in uh, just that one layer. So there are many possibilities, and uh, I don't have an answer to what you want to do. But um, <clears throat> whatever you track, it's the same as having one-step uh, chemistry, which goes from burned to unburned. And um, it gives you, if you have a zero flame width, then that's the equivalent of a tracked flame run. And among the many models in combustion, this is one of the standard models. Uh, it's uh, one of the crudest of models, but it, it, it certainly, for complicated problems, it has, it has a role. So it's called the sharp flame model. It's the ultimate form of simplified chemistry. <clears throat> so the equations contain a delta function source term for heat release and in energy and discontinuities in temperature, fluid composition, temperature dependent flow uh, such as viscosity. So they're very strongly nonlinear. And so um, they might very well survive the uh, extreme layering of a petroleum reservoir. Uh, so this says the same thing all over again. I don't have to repeat that. Uh, I think this says the same thing. Okay, now here's some more examples from, uh, to show you how this method works. This is another um, Rayleigh-Taylor problem with uh, three grid levels, coarse grid, medium grid, fine grid. And I think this is the uh, concentration of the two fluids with the color bar on the relative concentration uh, taken through the midplane where the, in the middle of the mixing. And I think you would all agree that this is converging but you'd probably also agree that it would be nice to know why or whether or how much it's converging. So we've developed a method of data analysis for that, and we regard these uh, simulations as stochastic, and um, this should appeal to the mathematicians in the audience. We're using the concept of young measures. Young measures are a famous tool for the study of conservation laws, one-dimensional conservation laws. And in the young measure, the idea is that every point, space, and time, you don't have a number or a solution value, you have a probability distribution. So it's intrinsically stochastic. You're solving an equation for a probability, a space-time dependent probability distribution. Now, as used in one dimension, that's an intermediate step. Uh, and <clears throat> eventually you prove, you, you first you prove that you have a solution, then you prove it's a, it's a strong solution, not so weak, it's a classical solution. So it's there for a little bit and then disappears. Um, we're proposing this as a model of turbulence, and it has the same character. Um, it's there and it's very convenient and it reflects the realities of computation and of data analysis and anything you want to do. Um, but we have a theorem, Gui Chong Chen and I, um, I should say theorem in quotation marks. We have a theorem with a hypothesis. The hypothesis is to assume the Kolmogorov statistics law I'm sure you might have heard of the five-thirds law for Kolmogorov statistics. It turns out that that five-thirds law is a um, 
Sobolev inequality. And I don't think that, although people have looked at that for nearly a century, I don't think that anyone realized that that was a Sobolev inequality. So what that gives you is an extra derivative, a fractional derivative you didn't know you have. We assume that, we get a fractional derivative. Now the solution, although it's, you might say is impossible in difficulty, it's sufficiently teetering on the edge of being solvable that that extra Sobolev inequality it pushes it over and we get a solution. So in fact, you do not actually need, you do not actually need these young measures, but um, they're very convenient to have anyway. So these are the um, examples of uh, young measures that were derived from the medium and the um, fine grid. So we divided the whole uh, data up into two by eight blocks, 16 blocks, coarse grid blocks. And in each block, you've got a whole lot of mesh cells. And you use those mesh cells to define a PDF. And so you get a space-time dependent PDF, and this is it. And so um, what we claim is that block by block, the left and the right uh, are more or less uh, the same. So for instance, this guy is sort of the same as this. And this is not quite the same as that. This is sort of the same as that, and here, and so on. Uh, up here, you have very good correspondence, very good convergence. So we get convergence of um, especially the uh, integral of the PDFs, the, C the CDFs, which is the first integral of the PDF, get good convergence. So you can put a norm on that, and the norm of the, C of the difference of the CDFs and this is coarse to medium, and it has a lot of yellow, which isn't so good. And this has a lot of blue, which is good. That blue is a, so you, the, so definitely the um, medium grid is closer to the fine grid than the coarse grid is. And then you can put a norm on these colors if you don't like uh, a view graph norm, and it is actually convergent. So here we've done that, and these are with different grid spacings. And uh, here you have, uh, for instance, a very nice convergence ratio if you take large supercells, and not such a good convergence ratio if you take uh, small supercells. So the main issue here is the statistical convergence and not the numerical convergence. Um, now here's something that might surprise you. And that is that these solutions are non-unique. Now, I don't suppose you've thought about that in terms of oil reservoirs, but you have the same potential for your oil reservoirs to go non-unique. Um, and that's a little bit frightening from an enduring point of view. <clears throat> it's a little frightening from the point of view of uh, predictive science and all the nice things that people like to talk about. And uh, <clears throat> how does it happen? Well, here's a physics level proof of non-uniqueness. The equations have n plus 1 dimensional parameters, dimensionless parameters. One of them is a Reynolds number. If you set, it has uh, n plus 2. If you set the Reynolds number to infinity, you have n plus 1 parameters left. What are they going to do? They've got to do something. So how could the solution be anything but non-unique? Now, I expect the mathematicians in here will be irritated at calling that a proof. Uh, but it's a physics proof. It's not a mathematical proof, but it's a physics proof. I think it's. Uh, very likely correct. <clears throat> and in any case, even worse, it's been observed numerically. Uh, and how do we cure it? Well, that's where this tracking comes in. It's these subgrid terms that parameterize the non-uniqueness. And uh, people love to leave them out because it's easier, and they don't understand them, and so they set them to zero. Uh, and then they just let the numerical algorithm fill in, 
And that means that the numerical algorithm, different algorithms have different subgrid parameters, they have different, basically different laws of physics. The numerical algorithm is a law of physics for this problem. And I believe that there are some aspects of petroleum reservoirs that would have that feature. And so you definitely need these subgrid terms to nail down that law of physics and not have the numerical non-uniqueness depending on the programmer's taste. Uh, so here's the problem. Numerical truncation error is a subgrid term. And so um, uh, anyway, uh, our algorithm is front tracking large eddy simulation, which um, uh, and dynamic subgrid models. I believe that reservoir simulators do some version of this. Uh, now, um, this is our simulation for multiple experiments. And uh, you can see we basically managed to duplicate uh, the growth rate for different experiments, even down to the difference between different experiments. And here's the disaster slide. There was a test problem set up, and about 10 different codes were given the identical input data and told to do it, and they got, oops, 50% variation from one, al from one algorithm to another and 100% variation relative to experiment. So this is the numerical proof of that disaster. And there's no reason why it isn't waiting for you in your reservoir world. So you do need these subgrid terms. Um, maybe that's a good point to, s oh, yeah, here is one more example here is a very fancy code run at the author's claim it was almost DNS, which means fully resolved. Um, and it misses uh, the data points uh, for two thirds of the, sim of the experiment. Uh, it, it has tenth order algorithms and no subgrid terms. So they went overboard on some aspects and completely missed on other aspects. And this is what they got. And we have a grid that's four times coarser and two times coarser. And this one's continued. It's over about here by now. And we hope to get it finished with going through all the error bars. <clears throat> so um, this is further proof of non-uniqueness. And even with the fanciest algorithms you can imagine, if you leave out the <coughs> subgrid terms or get them wrong, then you're in trouble. So um, I think I'll stop at that point. Thank you.